Uh, so good morning, everybody. Good, good morning. morning. How's everybody doing this fine day? All right. Yeah, it is beautiful. beautiful. Huh? This is like you sit outside, have your coffee on the front porch or back porch, or just in the street, wherever you want, really. Or it's church. A, or church, right? It's really nice outside. It's good to be here. Uh, that was a, a welcome reprieve uh, from the 90s. I mean, I enjoy the heat. I do. Um, but I'm just not quite ready for 90 in July, so it was good to have that. <laughs> um, well, I'm not be ready for it in July either. We don't know. <laughs> or June. June is the word I meant to say. Thank you, everyone. This is why. This is why I love you. Hold me accountable. I, I, I love that about you. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, this morning, and probably for the next many mornings uh, on Sundays, we are going to work through the book of Ephesians. Uh, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, I probably say that about arguably most of them. I don't know if there's any that I don't like, so I don't know if that's really a great way to, to tip it off. But I love Ephesians. Uh, it's from Ephesians, where some of my early uh, memory verses came out of. Uh, it's a book where I've spent a lot of time in just my own personal study and growth at the time that it has um, a lot of information related to just conflict, uh, related to proper behavior, how to conduct yourself as a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Christ. And it's got great instruction. Oftentimes the instruction has been uh, misused historically at times. We'll get to that in Ephesians 5, uh, where you, you know, we, we'll talk through the, 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 um, uh, the verses that talk about women submit unto your husband, right? But there's a, there's a lot of information, a lot more instruction for the men about how they should be treating their wives. So we'll get into all that later, and uh, hopefully it'll tie it all up nicely here, but uh, Ephesus uh, was a church kind of that was outside of Rome, obviously, and so there was um, a couple of different areas that may have actually been the intended recipient of the, uh, the letter to the church of Ephesus, and we know this because the Bible gives us a couple different references, especially there's one in, uh, in Corinthians that mentions how uh, the, church to La or the letter to Laodicea, and so there's actually some context here where this church, may, this letter may have actually been used as almost as, as a form letter, right? Meaning, uh, I'm going to send this out to a church, but it's not not intimately providing instruction to that specific body of worshipers. It wasn't saying, hey, you specifically are working with this issue. Uh, here's what not to do. We get a lot of that very specific, hyper-focused instruction in Corinthians. We see that in Galatians. Uh, because he knows them, right? He knows the people. He was he was either there or he was familiar with the people who were leading up those, those churches. So Ephesus is a, uh, is a neat place, but... Arguably, um, scholars over the years have, have gone back and forth on whether it was truly to Ephesus or to Laodicea. Ultimately, for our benefit, it makes no difference. The content is super valuable and beautiful either way, uh, but it does give us a bit of an understanding as to why it may have a bit of a, an air of aloofness, but more of a, a macro-instructive uh, piece of information for all of us here. So um, We know that it was written during the time that Paul was waiting to stand trial in Rome. And uh, one of the several epistles he wrote while he was hanging out there. Uh, we do know that um, a part of the intent of this letter was to serve as like an architecture or a blueprint. Like, hey, you church people, new to faith, new to life, a um, couple things we want to lay out for you first and foremost. And a big part of that is going to be talking through uh, what it means to understand our standing to God as it relates to grace. And so grace is actually a big part of what the first uh, section of, of Ephesians is about. So I love that you had that song because it was just perfect for this. And so uh, giving us an understanding of what grace actually covers, what it is and what it isn't, and then giving us instruction within that context. So um, we're actually going to read just a very small amount of Ephesians. We want to get past the third verse today. But I'll be reading a lot of other verses about it, so it's going to be great. Uh, at least I think so. I think you'll enjoy it too. <laughs> so as we work through it here, I want to just open up with the first uh, verse in Ephesians, in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, and it goes, uh, okay, great. So we have Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, you know, that Ephesus, to the saints in Ephesus, uh, some early manuscripts, they, they think that that may not have actually been there specifically, and they may have actually just inferred that by just kind of the relationship of how this information was received to the region. So don't you know, lose any sleep over it. Um, to Ephesus, it could be to the church at Brick by Brick Bible Church, right? It could be to us, right? It could be to us, the Church of Western New York. It could be all sorts of things. So uh, don't, don't let that be your, uh, your primary focus here. But 
what I do want us to look at is just the opening words here, right? To the saints in Ephesus, right? And so a lot of times we think, we hear the word saint, and we assume that there's some sort of uh, superiority, some sort of, uh, uh, you've earned a status of, of sainthood. Like, oh, you, you hear it sometimes, two people will say, oh, you're such a saint, because, I don't know, someone helped you cross the street. I don't even know. I'm a good example for that. But someone does something so wonderful, or they, they give some of their own time to spend some time with you, or they come over and they say, you know, I'm going to mow your lawn because I see that it's long and you're never been feeling well, I'm just going to do it. Like, oh, you're such a saint, right? And so we, we ascribe behavior of sainthood, and that should be a, um, a misconception. We shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't do, we shouldn't, we shouldn't ascribe behavior or platitudes or function with sainthood. Sainthood, very plainly dis, uh, explained here for each of us you know, here and operating in the New Testament or the New Covenant of, of a, uh, a resurrected Jesus timeline where we're at now, is that saint is just a sinless person. That's it. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a sinless person, but it's just a saved sinner. That's it. Someone who's been saved from their sin. That's it. So if you're saying, I put my trust in Jesus, and I know that there's no way under the Father but through Jesus, and I know that He has died for me, and I put my full faith and full belief in that, uh, you have now achieved sainthood. Super simple, right? That's the beauty of grace. The balance does not make sense. We are never going to earn a sainthood. It's not something we can ascribe or be, uh, but we're given it freely when we put our faith in Jesus. And so it's important that we understand the uh, distinction that we might hear from uh, being really, really good, or just someone who is a safe sinner. I know plenty of people who are safe sinners and are not, quote unquote, good people, right? I think that categorizes a lot of our own behaviors, right? Some of our own uh, tendencies or things that maybe irritate others. Maybe we're uh, inherently uh, agitating to everyone around us. I've, I'm not going to say I've been called that, but we're going to say that <laughs> I've been familiar with those, that language being used in my vicinity. And so uh, I understand that there are things in which I do that are not always. Uh, refreshing and enjoyable and attractive to all of those around me. I'm working on that. Certainly that's part of my, my work in faith is to become more um, more approachable, more more kind, more understanding, more loving. All these things, are all these are all functional things that I'm working on as part of my response to the gift of grace. So we're going we're gonna, to um, we're gonna participate here in just a moment in, uh, in our communion here. And we're going to work through some of what is being said here. But then we'll We'll jump back into Ephesians tonight, but I want to take some time here to just pause and reflect and, and do exactly as Jesus instructed us is that when we're taking communion, we're pausing and we're, we're, we're doing this in remembrance of Him, right? We said it right here on the, on the board here, is that we, we pause, we stop everything we're doing, we try to put the distractions of the world out of our mind for just a few moments and we think, we think about what Jesus did for us in Calvary. So if you folks can come up to grab our bread, we'll start there. So uh, this morning we're going to look at uh, where we have this instructions in Mark that talks through um, uh, Mark 14, 22 through 25 is our, is our backdrop for communion today here. And so a little different in uh, what we normally we usually reference the Corinthians uh, version of it here. But, but really this is, this is Mark's account of what took place that evening and his, uh, his, his attention to what happened that evening. So while they're eating, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. So, as a reminder to everyone in the room, to those not only there, but also here this morning, when we break it and we think about the bread, it's not his physical body, right? It's a symbol, it's a reminder of that which is beautiful and strong, is, is, is broken for us. And it's, it's for us to participate with it in that way. So it's not a, a physical participation in his body, but it's a reminder, it's a pause and a reminder of all that he did for us. So, um, let's take this together this morning. Uh, they're passing that out. You know, certainly there's a there's a lot of context to uh, this this passage. I know when I was uh, younger, uh, you know, we came up in a family that there was you know no alcohol, never allowed. So it was very much it was only grape juice. It'll never be grape juice. Um, and in some some cultures and belief systems, it's, it's exclusively wine. Right? Uh, we participated. You know as grape juice because it's still the same fruit of the vine, right? Fermented, not fermented. So it's important to get lost in the secondary issues. The, the, the picture for us is to, to, to pause and to know in the same way that, you know, um, when we're in the vine, we're also in him and he in us, right? So that's why he uses the grape as a reference to that. So if we're not in the vine, if we're not in Christ Jesus, uh, he can't also be in us. So that's the picture we have with the grape juice 
or the wine, whatever is being used. It's the same picture here. So he goes on to say, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. Let's take this together. It's our picture, our hope for that is that we know that uh, whenever Jesus provides us with a future reference or a future goal for us, uh, that's those are those are elements of our hope, right? So we know that he wouldn't say that unless we were to participate in that same kingdom with him, should we choose to live our life in such a way where we put our faith and trust in Jesus, that we're going to live in the kingdom of God with Jesus for those of us who follow Christ. So what I want to do then is go on to verse 3 here, where it gives us this uh, picture here, where uh, we see, um, I'm coming back to verse 2 later, uh, but praise, the, praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing of Christ. Every spiritual blessing that we receive and talk about here comes with a good amount of context here, right? And so, for us, we, there's whenever we see heavenly realms, there's things happening with respect to uh, what that means for us and how we interact with that. If it comes from heaven, it means it's other, it's other world. It doesn't come from um, our experience here on earth. There's a different experience that it's um, going to give us different pictures about Jesus. And so when we see that there's a spiritual blessing in Christ, a lot of us might think that it's, it's, it's only uh, a blessing. We assume it's only good, right? And certainly blessings are good, uh, but there's usually uh, to a blessing from God. We know that in Scripture they're formative. Uh, blessings from God are meant to teach us something, meant to draw us nearer to Him. They're meant to <clears throat> give us an understanding that we are not meant to do this on our own, and our faith should be exclusively placed in Him. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump through quickly and just walk through uh, the elements we see here that are, are, are other heavenly or other uh, gifts and, and, and blessings we receive in, in Christ. So we're going to take a look at His nature, what it looks like in relationships, service, suffering, inheritance, future glory in the kingdom, and citizenship in heaven, and we're actually just a pilgrim here on earth. We're just sojourners passing through. We, our citizenship is not here. So what we'll do is we'll just jump through each of those categories and provide you some scriptural context as to what that is telling us with respect to that blessing. So the first one, you don't have to turn here because I'm going to have them all up here. There's a lot. We'll get through them super fast or slow. I don't know. We'll see. All right. So the first one is 2 Peter 1.4. It says, the, through the through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by the evil uh, by evil desires. And so the nature here is Jesus' nature is that of holiness. It's, it's full of grace and humility and kindness. And so we understand that if we're experiencing or participating in the divine nature of Jesus, uh, we're going to be able to experience and receive his nature. So in context, let's put it this way. So uh, when something bad happens to you, your first response is, isn't necessarily going to be to blame everyone around you or even be angry at the world. It's to pause and reflect and say, okay, Jesus is using this. Uh, it's not as I intended. It's not what I wanted. But certainly it's here for a reason, and I'll do my best to work through that because um, while uh, not you know good things don't happen to everybody all the time, we understand that God uses all situations um, for his kingdom, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we know we need to look for where he's trying to grow us in that space. All right, so that's his, his, in his nature. So his divine nature is also that of a, in a, of a reborn nature. So if you think of Jesus, when he resurrected, he had a new body, new flesh, right? So when we are passed on from this world, right, and, and, and he returns and all of the saints, which are just saved sinners, right? When all, this, all the saints are brought again up in new in glory and they're, and they're given a new body and a new home and a new place in heaven, that's the divinity, that's, that's, that's the nature, that, that new body, that new experience that will be a beautiful blessing that we're given um, uh, from God as, as a result of our faith in Christ. So that's, that's the nature aspect. Now in life, so when we look at the blessings that relates to life, uh, when, Christ, when Christ who is your life appears, and you will also appear with him in glory. And, and so the picture here is that when he's showing up, you're going to be in, in glory with him. Should we have that opportunity to uh, uh, take that faith and say, yeah, God, Jesus, you're in charge, uh, not me. Or we see where it says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's pretty clear instruction for us here that if we are operating in this life, 
um, without him, um, it's not going to go well for us. And so you, you've seen uh, different things uh, and different examples that talk about where, you know, a lot of people might think that, you know, I'm going to do my life and also, you know, also get some God in my life as well, right? And, and the point is, um, when, um, when we look at just even the creation story, right? When God made uh, the fish, uh, and he made uh, he made the ocean for them to live in, to be part of. That is going to be part of their life source, right? When he made the plants, he provided uh, you know sunshine and provided the earth for that to be stationed and grown in. Uh, when he provided the expanse in the air, he did he did so with the you know with the, the casting of his spirit over the waters. And so we have this beautiful picture of him operating here. Well, when he created man, he did so. Uh, let's let's form let's form mankind in our image. Let's let's make it from ourselves. So that means that. Uh, if fish need water to live, and that's how they experience life, and animals receive uh, the, the earth and the area around them to live, then that's their livelihood. But mankind, we're made in His image, which means that we can only live or function when we're running on or experiencing our life uh, on God. So we're only meant to, that's supposed to be our fuel, is God. God is how we have purpose, it's how we have meaning, it's how we have grace, forgiveness, understanding, patience with one another. All that comes exclusively uh, from God, so that's what makes us different uh, than uh, a squirrel, uh, which are my bird seed nemesis. All right, so take a look at relationships, right? So Jesus like relationships, right? So Jesus said, "Do not hold on to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God." All right? So we have this picture of people who are trying to hang on to him. Said, "Don't go, man." This is near the ascension, and he's like, "Don't hang on to me." Not gone yet, but go and tell all my family, right? Go and make relationships, go do life with others that you are in your community. And it's not just relationships with those who are fellow believers, right? How many of us know someone who's not saved? Anyone? No one? Great. It's perfect. It means we're all qualified. This is perfect. So we all know someone who's not saved. And hang on, and we, we like them and are friends with them. Or maybe we're related to them, right? Any of those, right? All the above. All the above, right? So that's isn't that great. We're all in we're all in great position this morning to, to, to walk out and do work. So the picture here is to the instruction from Jesus here is that come on to my brother says to tell I'm gonna send my father and to my God and your God. So there's still work to be done here. And we see here also in Hebrews says both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Did that go? No one. All right. And so we have this here, and uh, the picture here is that we're looking at the relationships also within the context of the church, right? So we're looking at, okay, um, um, who makes people holy? Do we make ourselves holy? No, only God can make us holy. But we, are, but, but we are to be in the midst of our family and doing life with one another. And, and Jesus isn't ashamed to call them brothers or sisters, so neither should we, right? So our job as fellow Christians is to look out for uh, both the conduct, behavior, and love of others, right? I know that even even Christians have um, have conflict. Does anyone, does anybody know that? I don't know if you guys knew that, but I was just giving you some, some new information that even Christians have conflict in their relationships with other Christians, right? Has anyone ever been a Christian who had a conflict with another Christian that you love? You saw the conflict, right? This is great. We all have, right? And so, fortunately, uh, when we have the desire to uh, reconcile those relationships and, and, and understand our position and, re and receipt of grace, uh, we have nothing but ammunition to try to work towards making that relationship restored. And we're without excuse. God loves us endlessly, unconditionally, um, when we put our faith in Jesus. So we, as fellow believers, are, are uh, encouraged to work out these difficulties with one another so we can try to move forward and have stronger relationships. Um, we also will look at, at service, right? So we have a blessing of service. Some people might think of service as a blessing. Um, I'll tell you that um, in my wife and I, when we, when we first started serving uh, together uh, in the four-year-old room at the chapel uh, years ago, uh, I was very, very apprehensive. I was not excited to do it at all. But uh, just being in there a few moments, I was like, okay, this is going to be great. And I will tell you that the blessing that came from her and I working together and serving with one another brought us closer. It forces immediate crazy accountability because a child can sniff out weakness a mile away. Right? So if you guys aren't ironclad and completely on the same page, 
um, you know, chaos erupts instantly uh, within, the, within the room. And all of a sudden, everyone's throwing crackers, and there's paint everywhere. We didn't even have paint, but somehow they found it. No, and so the point is, in our, in our service, there's a beautiful thing that happens when, we are, when we're functioning in service, is, is that we have this blessing uh, to, to, to work towards, work with everyone in that space. So when teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. A lot of times we lose heart. Right? We get discouraged. We're like, you know, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I've been working at this job, or I've been trying to reach this person, or I've been trying to get this person to connect with me, right? And, I'm, and I keep on having this lost connection point. Our job is to make sure that, that we know that Jesus is with us, even to the very end of the age. A lot of times we try to be the author of all the things that are happening around us. Uh, when we have tried everything that functionally can move the narrative forward or can move the relationship forward or can heal the relationship and it's failing hand over fist, just failing, uh, it's a reminder to us that we are to be giving it to God. It's like, Lord, I can't fix this. This relationship's too busted. I don't know where to go. And our encouragement is here that we need to be giving this completely to God because He's with us. And he desires to help us right to the very end of the age here. So our encouragement in that service aspect is there as well. Also we see in John 17, 18, where we say, uh, as you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. So this is an instruction for the disciples. They look, uh, as I go out, you need to go out, right? So in the same way, Jesus was not stationary. He was never in one place for too long. He was always moving around. I'm not saying all of us need to like pack our bags and go to like Europe for six months and try to minister to everyone in Florence and have delicious food. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in our own community uh, and doing work in that way is that we have opportunity to go out into the world. Our world can be the, um, all these. You know, it can be uh, your place of work. It can be a family function. Right? A family function is a great place to stir controversy. I've said nobody ever. No one likes to go to a family party. Like, you know what? No, I'm going to do this time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make everybody romantic. And then, and then just go into it real excited to try to create that conflict. You know, our job, we are to be peacemakers, but certainly we are to be full of truth and full of love. And so when we are questioned about things that we believe, we are to be honest, loving, and forthright and say, look, this is what I believe. This is what Jesus says about this. And I believe what he says is, is true and uncorruptible and, and, and perfect. Um, and you can even say, I, I'm going to understand it fully because I'm not God, but I know I would trust it. And I believe it because when I put my faith in this truth, uh, God has shown me great mercy time and time again. And usually your story about your walk and your faith and your commitment with Jesus is going to be the, um, the thing that makes a difference in others' lives. You know, I can show up to somebody, read them 35 scriptures, they'd be like, that's wonderful. I don't even know you, right? Or if they're going through a hard time, you go to them and you say, hey, look, you know, I, know where, I know where you've been. I've, I've, I've experienced what you, what you just had happen to you. It's terrible. I'm so sorry. But I'll tell you, there's hope on the other end of this. There's, there's opportunity to have faith and to, to know this is temporary, even though it seems really permanent right now. But there's hope on the other side of it. That's going to be what's going to draw people to Jesus. It's going to be how God used your life to get them to understand that they're not uh, in that place forever. A couple more. We're almost here, guys. Suffering. All right, so suffering. This is great. So suffering. <laughs> Uh, Philippians has some instruction in the blessing for the heavenly blessings of suffering. Uh, why is suffering a blessing? Uh, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. Now this is difficult for us to really conjure and fully have a full appreciation for here in the good old U.S. of A., right? We're able to, to worship freely. We can say we love Jesus freely. We can assemble in churches freely. Um, in some churches, and there's maps, I don't have it with me, but there are maps that... Um, actually will tell you geographically on the earth where A, uh, Christianity is restricted, and meaning you aren't able to assemble worship. And then there is another map that's kind of a deeper shade of red that says that Christianity is, uh, is forbidden and the consequences are uh, capital in nature. So if you're caught uh, holding a church group or you're uh, having a Bible study, if you're even caught with a Bible, Holy Bible, it could cost you your life, right? So there is a, there's a sentiment here where uh, you know, we suffer for Christ. And so a lot of us might think, oh, because I'm not experiencing that, I'm not a good enough Christian. I'm not suffering good enough. Well, no, that's not what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to say is there is, there is perspectives for all of this. Um, our suffering might be something as simple, but yet challenging as 
telling a loved one that I feel like the way that you're conducting yourself in your life is wrong. And they're going to say, well, you're just a bigot. And you don't, you don't love well. And you just only think about life through your perspective, your worldview. Um, and it's hard to hear that, right? Because their, their, their perception of you is that it is how you hold yourself. You do have a, a narrow worldview. That you, you only think of yourself as being good. People don't generally like to, to swim in the truth because it causes them to grow, and that can be uncomfortable. It can be uncomfortable to grow, especially when the truth is about ourselves and the way we conduct ourselves. In verse 310 here it says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and the, and the participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. And so we understand that in our life we will experience a physical death. I mean, the number one cause of death in the world is dying. The, the quick statistic I pulled up for you this morning. Uh, and so we're all going to experience it. And so we understand that the, uh, the in introduction of sin into the world has brought that upon us. But there is a permanent, a, a eternal death, uh, which extends beyond the physical death. Right? And that is, that is operating in a way that you are in conflict with God. And how we are operating in conflict with God is when we ignore His Son. We, and we ignore the Messiah. Right? Jesus says very clearly, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father but through me. Uh, no clearer words were spoken of instruction from Jesus, right, for us to follow. If we think we can do it our own way or from a good person or any of those things that the world wants you to hang on to and cling on to, um, you will um, you will find yourself very disappointed and, and full of things that are, that are temporal because they're not meant to sustain us like God is. Or we see in Colossians 1, 24 here, it says, Now I rejoice, I rejoice uh, in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up my flesh with what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. So Paul, and this, this was a letter to the church of Colossus, but this was, he was reflecting on his own uh, doom, his own fate here. Uh, he was happy to experience great suffering because he knew that his work was going to improve or to move forward the operation of the church. And the church is, like I said earlier, it's not a physical location or building. It's not the church of Brick by Brick Bible Church. It's all of the people who are following Christ it is the church of Christ. And so uh, in that example there, it's, it's important that we must sometimes have to make sacrifices in our life, whether it's in our schedule or in our, our time or in our talents. And we're going to give of that resource that we have freely uh, to God, and it's not really a, a suffering in, in the way of, of death, but it's a it's a sacrificial. I'm doing away with this thing so it can improve uh, the church in some way. Looking at inheritance, Romans eight sixteen through seventeen says the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. If we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. So the inheritance in all this is that we will live in eternal. Uh, uh, existence or eternal presence uh, with God. That to me sounds great. And a lot of times you might think that uh, the things of this world are fantastic, they're amazing. You think about, you know, yachts, going golfing, you know, for days on end. That's your thing. Maybe maybe it's sledding in July. Uh, that would not be me. I don't go sledding in July. Uh, but there are things that we think that are just it, right? Maybe it's a that, that mansion of a home, or maybe it's that amount of money in your check account where you're just like, okay, I finally arrived, I'm finally comfortable, and um, all that pals in comparison uh, to the inheritance we have in Christ Jesus. The inheritance we have is to be co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs, let me think about that. If you if you are, has anyone ever been the recipient of uh, a beneficiary of someone passing, right? Um, and you're, you're an heir or you are a recipient of something that uh, you did nothing to earn. Nothing. You just existed. You were a person who happened to be alive. Certainly, maybe you had a good rapport with them. Maybe that's why you were chosen to be that. Um, but in the same way, uh, God has chosen us to be a recipient or a beneficiary to the work that He did in our behalf. All we have to do is, is put our faith in Him and trust that He has us. Even when it's hard. Usually when it's hard, it becomes hard. <laughs> Future glory in the kingdom. All right, this is a big one. All right, so I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration, 
not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. There is a ton being said there. And we're not going to look into all of that because we have to go home at some point today. But, but I, the, the key things I want to pull out of here is that the glory for the kingdom here is that is that this last verse where it says that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children. So we are functionally bondage to decay. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're suffering, we're decaying, and we're wasting away physically, right? But we can be growing and strengthening spiritually when we have our faith in Christ. And that's, that's the picture of that future glory, right? Is that the things we do now matter, but, it, but it's, it's for a reason. It's for something that extends beyond our time here. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out into the darkness and into his wonderful light. All right, there's this beautiful picture of us as a royal priesthood. All of us. Everybody in this room, look around at royal priesthood. Hi, it's good to meet you, royal priest. It's great to see you. Um, all of us seem wildly unworthy of that title, right? I mean, I know I do a royal priesthood. I don't know what that means. I mean, I do know what it means. But, you know, in the sense of what it means in relationship to God, I've done nothing to earn it, and yet he gives it to us freely. He wants us to operate in that space uh, with Him. And we have this promise here. And this whole, this whole section, you know, future glory in the hymn, this is just littered with promises for us. This is just for us to cling on to and just trust that, you know, if I put my faith in Christ, I have this to look forward to. This is amazing, right? This, these are all just promises and promises of God. Uh, Revelation tells it this way. It says, and, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve as God and Father. To Him glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Or in 5.10, it says, You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Right? So there's this beautiful picture of this eternal moment that extends beyond this moment. It extends backwards as well, I would imagine. That's the nature of eternity. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. Um, but the picture we have here is that we will have great hope and great opportunity to be serving and enjoying uh, life with God you know, uh, intentionally, intimately. In a way that we couldn't even possibly imagine here on earth. So, lastly, citizen of heaven, pilgrim on earth, uh, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and the high priest. So, a lot of times we want to think to ourselves, I don't know what to do. I've prayed this this prayer. I've read this verse. I don't know what to do. I've already read you know the Bible eight times. I can't read it any further. Uh, and you might have this position of hopelessness, right? Uh, well, this instruction is pretty clear. It says, just who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. That's it, just fix your thoughts on Him. What that means is instead of fixing your thoughts on how am I going to make the budget work this week, or how am I going to accomplish this task, um, uh, the, the, the instruction here is to focus our efforts and our thoughts, have Jesus be the primary thought of all of our, all of our doings, and to give Him that first primary attention. Lastly, uh, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wave war against your soul. This is the last piece of instruction here, just as a, as a blessing uh, from, the, from the heavenly blessings that we receive and understand from God. So dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wave war on your soul, which is hard. A lot of times in our mind we might think if I have a temptation to sin, I've already failed, right? That's not true. Uh, the temptation exists as a nature of our nature. Uh, the actual execution of that temptation is where it then converts into sin, becomes problematic. Thinking a thing and doing a thing are two different things. Now certainly, the more you fix your thoughts on Jesus, those temptations will become less of an occurrence in your mind because there's no room for this thing to take a real estate in your heart or in your mind. So our last verse today is just Ephesians 1-2. We only read three verses today, guys. Um, is the last one here, which you see this a lot. It's a wonderful greeting, it's an opening, but it's a beautiful thing for us to know that as the Church of Christ, we all should, should just love and provide this, uh, this heart posture towards one another. It says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close the prayer, guys. Father, we thank you so much for your words this morning. Your many, many pieces of instruction and guidance and blessings and uh, encouragement for each of us to, to live by and to have hope in, and to know that uh, we are completely uh, handled and loved and cared for by you, and that uh, we're not meant to do this life uh, by ourselves. When things seem impossible, uh, we know that when we put our faith in, in Christ, uh, we have a hope uh, that 
that others in the world who are outside of you don't have. We know that uh, while the things of this world will fade, we know that you will endure forever. As your word endures forever. We're so thankful for that. So I pray that as we, as we go out this week and have opportunities to, to witness to others, whether it's a friend or a loved one or a relative, that you would just give us the grace and the humility and the heart posture to understand that uh, uh, the intention shouldn't be about us and our personal desires and our uh, wants and needs, but it should only be about what Jesus has done for us. And then from that, all these other things come fully into view more clearly and more beautifully. So we just pray that you'd help us to be people who put you first in our mind and dwell on you and all that you've shown us. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.